Scott Adkins. I suppose I, I run the Brooklyn writer space. I have huge issues with health insurance. Uh, I don't actually believe in it. I think we should abolish it completely. Um, it's actually a form of nationalized health care that doesn't work because it's, it's only available to few um, and not everybody. And uh, it seems like we already have mechanisms in place like Medicare and Medicaid to take care of catastrophic situations. So if you can divert health insurance money into, into a larger pool to handle catastrophic uh, situations, then uh, you don't need health insurance. Uh, what that would do to the overall economy, I don't know. And I'm sure there's plenty of economists who would disagree with getting rid of health insurance because of the jobs that it creates. But um, personally, I just feel that a, a 20 to 28 percent profit margin on an individual's health is uh, immoral and unnecessary. Um, and then once catastrophic is guaranteed and paid for by the, by the government, essentially, we don't have to worry about it. And uh, you move into a competitive market and uh, you make your preventative care uh, paid for on an as-needed basis, um, which sort of changes the entire model of expectation of um, how to uh, take care of yourself. So you make sure you go to the doctor once a year, you exercise more, you eat better, uh, because if you, if you take care of yourself, it'll cost you less money. Um, then the services become competitive, so you can actually shop around. You're not restricted to an in-network type of doctor or that sort of situation. And uh, I think you will see a drop in the expenses of, of how much health care is, and uh, everyone will be able to afford it and will go to the doctor. Um, why we expect uh, preventative care health to be paid for by anybody is, is sort of a strange phenomena. Um, and it also causes a, uh, uh, a lopsided service within, within, uh, within the economy and for the pop general population. The model that the Freelancers Union has is, is actually probably a step in that direction in a way because they've taken it on their own. Um, providing their own uh, service of health insurance, reducing the profit margin, eliminating it, um, giving the power of group to negotiate rates down and everything. You still have the fundamental issue of in-network and lack of choice, but it does create a, a model that's more affordable for, for freelancers. So it's a, it's a necessary stopgap, I think, to probably the ultimate goal, which is to abolish health insurance by and large. Um, you know, if you go, if you look at the differences between how much health insurance costs in New York State versus how much health insurance costs in Iowa, say, uh, it's it's a dramatic difference, and um, that just shouldn't exist. The, the the inequality of 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 why health insurance costs more in, in certain places and not in the others is it just shouldn't exist. I, I look at them as almost unattractive, uh, just because of the nightmares that they that they sort of project. Um, if you look at the National Health Service in England, I know people think of that as like how not to provide health health care, and uh, which is which is why the the concept of a competitive health health care market becomes much more attractive than a completely nationalized one. Um, what you want to do is create an environment where people are seeking services for what they need and not unnecessarily. Health insurance actually makes you seek services unnecessarily because you want to get more bang for your buck. Um, just because a corporation or a company provides your health care um, doesn't mean that it's not being paid for. And it's an unnecessary um, weight on, on corporations to have to pay $1,000 a month per employee to be competitive in a market um, for health insurance. It's just, it's, it's a lot of money that is going into other people's pockets unnecessarily. It sounds like it. It seems like uh, Sarah Horowitz and the Freelancers Union is actually making a uh, making strides and 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 helping the the independent worker, um, but I, I really can't speak too much upon it because um, I'm not that familiar with it. I can give you my uh, personal take on retirement savings, um, which which is just my own personal confusion as to how the stock market actually works in our. In our current times, uh, as a contemporary stock market versus like its its uh, previous inception, which was to help companies expand, give them money to to do their to do their work and everything, it seems like we're moving towards a decorporatization of uh, of of the country because corporations actually fundamentally are flawed for some reason, and um, and uh, are 
so, so in that sense, it feels like, why are we pouring more money into the stock market? Do we really understand when we put money into the stock market how it's being used? Um, we're trusting uh, funds to be managed by very few people in the country uh, and to invest it wisely. And we're looking at bottom line returns and everything. And the expectation is to, to get a return on that versus, versus thinking of it in terms of, I would like to invest in this company because it's a green company and I believe in it and I'm not gonna worry about the return. I'm actually putting my money in there because I want that company to do well. Um, so the, the, the model of retirement savings is, is a broken one in a way because the expectation is you need a seven to 11% return over the life of your, annually over the life of your investments over 30 years or whatever so you can have enough money to retire with. Um, retirement is a strange concept to me as well as a freelancer because I don't believe I'll ever retire. Um, and so I sort of have, I have very mixed feelings about putting money into a, into a retirement plan right now. I do, I, I, my own investment plan is I put $100 a month into Intel, into a dividend reinvestment plan because I believe in technology. I love technology. I'm an addicted technophobe or whatever. And, uh, and so I give Intel $100 a month. I give that them. I don't expect anything. Um, I hope it does well. You know, the dream would be to, you know, have the stock grow and, and double and do all those, those sorts of things. But those are pipe dreams, really, in the end. Um, you can't bank on that. You can't, you can't rely on that. Um, so I have, no, I have no current plan in, in my retirement savings because I don't have enough money to do that. Um, I wish I did. I really don't know. I feel like I feel like um, it's not a skill as much as uh, as much as an ability to think critically uh, and seriously about what's going on around uh, people. And I'm thinking about the the, the new generation coming out of universities uh, currently. Um, their computer skills are are already sort of like inherent, and uh, and so older freelancers will need to continue to keep up with their their technological skills and ability to work with the internet um, and uh, be able to work electronically in general uh, with their clients, so to speak. Um, and I think that's just a productivity issue, but uh, possibly um, skills that would be more relative would be the ability to seek out work, um, to create work for themselves, uh, to create their own uh, sort of Micro economy for themselves. Um, I feel like that's possibly something that I've done for myself in order to maintain a career as a playwright. I don't actually have any expectation to make money as a playwright or to, to until I'm really, really old, hopefully, <laughs> you know. Um, but uh, so I've created a I've created a day to day existence that that sort of like fits into a model. So it's a rethinking of. It's needs-based thinking, so it's it's rethinking what my expectations are for myself and how I would like to exist day to day, and I think that's an important skill to have of like, of uh, being able to say, I, I I don't want to get on a train every day, uh, and go to work for somebody. I want to work for myself, and um, this is how I'd like to see my day structured. Absolutely, I work everywhere. It's it's amazing uh, what we can do now and. Uh, you know, from from working with an eye touch, you can you can do so much work to working on your laptop. It's it's I have my entire business on a laptop. Um, everything's there, all my plays, everything, my photos of my children, whatever. It's it's completely self-contained and virtual, um, so I can sit down and do my work anywhere. Um, the existence of the writer space is interesting because people actually make that a destination workplace. Uh, so we have roughly 160 to 170 members a quarter. And um, people come and do their work there, but they also do some work at home and do some work in the coffee shops or wherever. So it's sort of like another place for them to, to put in their mix of locations to do their work. Um, so yeah, technology is amazing right now in terms of, of wireless technology being readily available, um, predominantly free uh, and accessible, and it does enable you to do things uh, anywhere, really. Well, my wife and I had a had a child, uh, our first son, and uh, we realized that working at home uh, in the apartment wasn't going to work for us anymore. So we needed a place to work, and a friend of ours told us about the writers' room, and uh, which is the the first 
space of this kind, I think, in New York City that was that was made. And uh, we went over and talked to them about it and uh, realized that the waiting list was way too long. At that time, it was two and a half years to, to actually get accepted into the space. So we talked to them and said, asked them what they thought about us starting up a similar space in Brooklyn. And they res responded very positively and said that would be great. Uh, because of their waiting list, uh, it would actually alleviate the pressure for them. Um, so that was the inspiration, really. Also, I had just lost my job. I'd been severed from a corporation. I was working at a financial company. And uh, I had started there as a temp, and then uh, very slowly the golden cage had been built up around me and uh, uh, had been feeling trapped and complacent at the same time. So it was difficult to, to sort of like have the motivation or initiative to, to leave the cage. Um, so they did it for me, and that was a major inspiration. Uh, so once, once I left there, then I started thinking about how I wanted my day to be structured and what I would like to do. And so it became sort of a, a great union uh, in terms of creating this space, making that sort of the thing that occupied me to uh, provide some sort of income, and also having a space for us to, to make our creative work um, and to be surrounded by an incredible community of writers, which has been an unbelievable inspiration. It's been totally amazing. It's, it's a fascinating experience. It's, um, as, a, as diverse as there are as many kinds of writers. And uh, some people don't like to talk to anybody at our writer space, um, but they will talk about how amazing it is to actually sit in a room with 20 other people working together and typing, uh, typing out their work, and you sort of get this buzz, this undercurrent of, of energy. Um, even though someone might be playing solitaire next to you, it doesn't matter because you, you sort of project that <laughs> They're doing this amazing work, and uh, it becomes it becomes this this motivator for you to work really hard, and uh, and in that sense, it's, you're still solitary because you can't see anybody in our space, um, but you can feel them, and that's that's a great experience. And then there's another group of people who who like to take breaks, and they'll come out into the lounge and talk to other people and sort of work things out verbally or or vent about uh, the current political things or whatever, whatever is on their mind and, and have great discussions about that and heated debates sometimes and then they'll go back and get to work on their fiction or their autobiography, whatever. We, we try to keep a consistent environment uh, as much as possible and I think that's the key is to, uh, to allow people to know what to expect when they come into the space. Um, that's, that's important for fostering anything, I think, is consistency. Uh, change is difficult for everybody. Um, anytime we change one little thing in the space, there's always a little, little bump. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's a positive bump, sometimes it's a negative bump, and then everything evens out and everyone's okay again. So uh, we just keep a clean space. Uh, we provide um, you know, a place to put their food, uh, a place to talk on the phone, to print their work. It's, there's nothing, there's no secret really. Uh, I also try and keep the walls blank as possible in the back room, uh, provide an eclectic collection of books, um, which are completely random and found on the streets of Brooklyn. So uh, uh, that also, I think, helps a lot, too. If someone gets stuck, they can just pick up this random book about mythology and start looking through it, or a quotation book, and find some inspiration there to you know, get the gasoline lit again and going. I think the the nugget is to um, which was which was the piece of advice given to me from from some folks at the writers room, which was keep it simple uh, and don't try to expand beyond what you're trying to do. Which uh, in our case was providing a desk, a lamp, and a chair. Um, there really is no need to differentiate yourself in in sort of like providing a space. So whatever you do, if you stay focused on uh, the primary objective, is which it should be a simple objective then you can do that really, really well. If you diversify too much, uh, it can become an issue. Um, one of the other things that, and, and when we first started, banks were very reluctant to even consider providing money to us. In fact, nobody gave us money. We had to put most of it on credit cards. Luckily, at that time, it was all 0% credit cards. So uh, we sort of like took a major risk. Um, so we asked ourselves the one question of, if we put uh, I had a little severance package. If we put all the severance into this and we come out of this with a major piece of debt and it doesn't work, 
will we feel good about having done this? And uh, the answer was yes. It would be worth it, and uh, if it's worth the risk, then you can go for it. If it's not worth the risk, then don't do it. Uh, I did try to create a nonprofit, and the state denied it. Um, they, they said that we were not a nonprofit company. We were a, a for-profit company choosing not to make a profit. Interestingly enough, I realized from that and going over to the Foundation Center that we didn't need to be a nonprofit. We were just sort of like following in the footsteps of the Writers Room, which was a nonprofit. Uh, and so, if you can think of ways to, to create an efficient model where you don't have to have extra programming and extra sources of revenue in terms of if you're a nonprofit, you need a grant writer. So, that person needs to write grants to actually pay themselves and then provide another uh, uh, stream of programming which could be unnecessarily and more work than you actually need to do. Um, so for us, it really was one of these things of like, I need time to write and I need a place to work. And, and so we kept it as simple as possible. And I wouldn't consider that an entrepreneurial ac outlook actually. It's more of a, a anti-entrepreneurial. It's more limiting and, and modest. And so I think it's important to look at what your needs are, uh, what your expectations are for yourself, and, and go there and not try to say in, in 10 years I want to have yachts and, and extra summer houses and all this stuff if that's really not what you want to do. Because, <laughs> well, first of all, you can't do that if you open up a writer space. Uh, but if that's the kind of business you want to open, then, then you go down that path. I think there is a problem with um, fostering writing in, in, in the educational system. Um, I think it, it, I have two kids, one's eight and one is turning six in June. And what I see right now in the, in the lower, lower grade levels is uh, such an, an incentive to provide uh, high stakes tests and performance on these high stake tests that it sort of negates the purpose of education in general. Um, and uh, testing is, is useful. However, when so much pressure is put on it, it becomes, in my mind, negative. It has a negative impact. So, so you sort of squelch the, the creative environment in, a, in an odd way, and it makes it very difficult for teachers to operate. Uh, they do, I think teachers do an amazing job in the New York public school system in working with these high-stake tests uh, and, and trying to create an environment, but it's, it's extremely difficult. I don't know what, what that means for, for the upper grades yet. I'll find out. Um, I do know what it means for students coming into uh, Brooklyn College, for example. Uh, my wife teaches English one there and playwriting. And she sees a, a, a vast array of students coming in. And my father taught uh, uh, English for about 32 years, and he saw a dramatic um, downturn in, in students' abilities to actually write on their own. And it's, it is nerve-wracking and scary, and it was very frustrating for him. Uh, and it's frustrating for my wife as well um, to have these students coming in who are, are really smart and intelligent people, but they don't have the ability to think as well as they should. Um, and so it becomes a, a, a double challenge in the humanities area of trying to teach critical thinking and take that criti critical thinking to the page. Um, it's hard for me to agree with them in terms of, uh, because I see so many writers at the writer space. Uh, we served over 500 writers, and they're all amazing. And and the the, the kind of work that they're putting out is incredible. Uh, my community of playwrights is huge. Um, it might not be visible, but there is a really really strong community. Uh, the master's programs seem to be getting more aggressive and more alternative. Uh, I happened to go to the Brooklyn College MFA program for playwriting, and studied with Mac Wellman, where um, what he taught me was not how to write because the assumption is you know how to write when you come in. But he taught me how to think. He taught me how to follow a passion, how to follow a path, how to open up a book and find the nugget inside that book and research it and continue working with it until I could use that as the fuel for my work in the, in the place. Um, and there's a lot of new writers coming out of those programs. The fiction program is incredible over at Brooklyn College as well. Um, so. I also feel like blogs are inspiring writing as well. There's a lot, even though it's a freer form, it's more of a, a sort of a journal type, public journal type of, of form. There's a lot of writing going on there as well. Um, I don't, they're not always good, 
<laughs> but practice makes perfect. And so if there's more opportunities to practice and more opportunities to write, the better you will get. That's just, that's just proven over time. Um, printed matter, what's going to happen to printed matter? That's, that's a big question. Um, we've seen the music industry suffer. We've got you know, the Virgin Megastore shutting down in Times Square uh, because maybe because of the recession, likely because people are downloading more music. So what's going to happen to printed matter in the, in the, the brick and mortar bookstores and that sort of thing? Are people going to actually read more online? Are they going to be able to read um, long, long pieces in an electronic format? That's questionable as well. Um, but I don't, feel like, I, I don't feel like writing is suffering. I feel like there's more opportunity for writers now than there were in the past. Um, maybe this is an ignorant or a naive perception, but it feels like in, in the old days, writers were independently wealthy. Um, and now writers aren't necessarily independently wealthy. They're able to actually create their work and maintain a freelance lifestyle for their income until they can, until they can get paid for their work. Um, I think one of the major changes in this recession, though, is uh, the expectations from publishers right now. Um, the thing I'm seeing over at the space is they're looking for uh, a 30 to 60 percent proposal of a book versus 10 percent. Um, that's a huge a huge strain on a freelancer. When you have to dedicate six months to creating 30 to 60 percent of a book before it is even considered for publication, um, that's a lot of time. And you got to be able to bank that time with some sort of income. Versus before, uh, five years ago, writers were getting paid sizable advances, enough for them to live on based on shorter, much, much shorter proposals and even 30 second pitches, that sort of thing. Um, that's a big change right now. Uh, and so, yes, we'll probably see some, some impact there. Fewer writers will be published because they won't be able to support themselves while they put together these long proposals. Theater is not something that should be taught. Theater is something that should be done. Um, it's, it's, and, and you can create a teaching environment for that by doing. It's more of a practicum than anything. Um, it's, uh, you, can, you can work with form and structure and try and you know, rewrite plays within a certain form and structure, and that's, that's only one way to do it. Um, theater is an experiential, communal uh, sort of entity. So it's people coming together in a live environment and having a common experience together. It's unlike any other form. It's not literature. It is performance and experience. It's a visceral thing. And so I think probably one of the problems with theater, which I hope you will contact Mike Daisy about this because he's currently in a, an open, open letter uh, discussion with a regional theater. And, and his point is the, that theater has failed America. He's got this amazing piece on that. And, and the reason is because it's become corporatized. And, and artists need to be paid, and theater artists need to be paid, writers, but also the performers. Uh, and they need to be paid appropriately. And, and because of the corporatization, uh, they aren't being paid appropriately. And so that's how he believes that theater has failed America. And that sort of model, that sort of conventional model, I think is uh, not very helpful, not very helpful at all for, for, for creating new work. It doesn't, there's no incentive to produce new work. The incentive is to produce work that isn't new. It also um, forces expensive tickets. It's, you know, ultimately theater should be free. Uh, you know, that would be wonderful. But, you know, we're looking at, at, at downtown theater now. I think the base ticket price is, is 18 or 20 bucks. I mean, that's unbelievable. That's a lot of money. And that, you know, that I, I can hardly afford to go see shows. And so I don't go see shows very much. I go see shows that are produced by my friends um, and sort of my community, which becomes an insular bubble in a way. But those are the shows that I know I'm going to like, and it's low risk. Uh, but um, it's, it's difficult for me to, to, to think that spending $65 on a ticket is, is right. That's, that's so much money. Um, and uh, it's, yeah, I, it, the model is broken right now. And, uh, and the canon should not be taught. <laughs> I think that's to continue teaching this sort of conventional model of how to make theater. And and do theater is 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 not 
uh, productive as far as creating new voices, as far as creating new instigations, new questions, new ways of thinking, impacting more people in a wider audience. Inherently, theater has a small audience. Um, it only has so many shows. It only has so many seats. It's not like movies. And theater should not be written like a movie. Movies should be written like movies. If you're going to write a piece of theater like a movie, then go make a movie. Uh, you'll have a much bigger audience, and it just won't be a waste of time for the people sitting there. Nature Theater of Oklahoma. They're, uh, they're totally resisting the corporate trend, but they're in the... Uh, um, what would the model be called? The, there's Elevator Repair Service, there's the Wooster Group. These are independent groups that uh, create a piece of theater over a long period of time. Um, so they really, they really stew inside of it, uh, and then they take it on tour. Their market is not in America, it's Europe. Uh, so, so I guess in, in terms of resisting a corporate model, they're <laughs> resisting it. Well, they're not resisting. They'd love to be able to tour America uh, indefinitely, but it just doesn't happen that way. Um, so they are resisting the corporate model in terms of regional theaters just won't take them all the time. Um, I think other groups that are doing that are Clubbed Thumb and 13P. 13P is, uh, uh, my wife's part of that, uh, was started by Rob Hendel and a group of 12 other playwrights. And they're a, a collective. And so it's a collective of playwrights and they produce their own plays and they produce it every every year. And their, their motto is, we don't just write plays, we, make, we, we produce plays. And, uh, and that is a complete about face uh, against a corporate model. And so it sort of fits into the model of the writer space, where it is uh, a power in numbers. Uh, and if you have enough people, everybody benefits. And so, you know, 13P gets a lot of attention. They have a great fundraiser every year. They raise enough money to produce the next show. And uh, that also works well. There's a group I'm in that's called Joyce Cho. Uh, now, we're not able to pay ourselves anything, <laughs> but that's not the point. Uh, one of the, when we, the last show we did was back in, uh, uh, at the Prelude Festival at CUNY Grad Center. And someone asked the question of, what, uh, what would we do if somebody gave us a big check? And the, the response was, we'd, we'd buy health insurance. And so that's sort of the, <laughs> even though I'm anti-health insurance, it's all right, I could be a hypocrite, right? <laughs> and so basically the, the, the concept behind that is it's like use the money for something that's a little more uh, humanitarian versus, versus like spending it on whiz-bang lights and, and sound and this and that and the other. Uh, technology in our environment has is, is been a huge help. We're able, we're able to like come up with technological solutions on our own, making stop animation videos that are actually theatrical and, and and, and illuminate a piece of theater or, or allow us to present something in a way that helps us juxtapose against the, against the live performance also happening. Sound is, is a lot easier to do. All these things can be done on a laptop. So it's, it's reducing the model of like having a huge budget. Big budget does not necessarily mean wonderful show. Sometimes it works, but a lot of times it's pointless. Mm -hmm.